Fifteen years ago, I started to have a recurring dream. Now, like many dreams, the details were hazy, but when I would wake up after this dream, there was always one thing that I would remember. I was driving down a country road. And the location was different each time, but I always was driving and never stopping. There was no point of departure and no place of arrival. I was just endlessly, endlessly driving. And I started to have this same dream several times a week. Nothing like this had ever had, uh, occurred to me before. And, and I began to wonder if maybe God was trying to tell me something. At the time, I was meeting with a friend regularly for discussion and prayer, and I shared this dream with him. So we spent time talking about it and praying about it, and we concluded that God was using that dream as a parable for the current season of life in which I was in. You see, I was busy in ministry at that point in my life, but I wasn't actually accomplishing much. And like the image in the dream, I was just driving around and around and around and not ever really getting anywhere. And that realization led to a lot of soul searching and a lot more prayer and ultimately to a major change in the ministry that I was involved in. And I got involved in a ministry where I had a clear sense of purpose. It was a major transition in my life and it took place because God spoke to me through a dream. And dreams are one of the tools in God's toolkit. And if necessary, he may choose to speak to us through a dream. God not only speaks at times through dreams, once in a while he gives someone the unique ability to interpret dreams. And that's the case with Daniel. Daniel is a faithful Jew. He's been captured and he's living in exile in Babylon and he has been conscripted to serve as an advisor to the evil king Nebuchadnezzar. And to help Daniel survive and thrive in that environment, God has given Daniel great wisdom and he's given him the ability to interpret dreams and visions. In our Bible passage this morning, we will see that King Nebuchadnezzar has a very vivid dream and he threatens to kill his advisors unless they can tell him what it means. Now, now because of Daniel's gift, that puts him on the spot. He needs to come up with the right answer. But how should he respond to a tyrannical king who issues threats at the drop of a hat? What should Daniel do when his life is on the line? Let's take a look and see what we can learn from Daniel in Daniel chapter 2. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. So here in these verses, we, we get this story placed in a, its historical context. And the key point for us is that it's early in Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He's a relatively new king. Daniel is a brand new advisor to him, and they don't yet have an established relationship. They don't really know each other. And it's during these early days that the king experiences some sort of, of vivid dream that results in sleepless nights. Now, in most ancient cultures, dreams were viewed as supernatural events. And there were a variety of wise men, particularly astrologers and magicians, who trained themselves in the art of dream interpretation. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar calls for some of these specialists. He wants answers. And as we're going to see, he's go he will be ruthless, ruthless in his pursuit of getting the answers that he wants. 
The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. How's that for an incentive plan? But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. And then the king answered, I'm certain that you're trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I firmly decided. If you don't tell me the dream, there's only one penalty for you. You've conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream. And then I'll know that you can interpret it for me. And the astrologers answered the king, there's no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among humans. And this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Well, as we can see, like most dictators, King Nebuchadnezzar rules through tyranny. And people obey because they fear him, not because they trust him. And he obviously doesn't trust his counselors either. And so he demands that they tell him what the dream is and then interpret it. Now, why would he ask them to do something so difficult? Well, based on what he says, he evidently believes that if he tells them the details of the dream first, then they're just going to make up some interpretation. They want to buy time until the king moves on to some other issue and hopefully forgets about the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar is so troubled by what he has seen that he desperately wants to know about the dream and therefore he makes this virtually impossible request and he follows it up with a brutal threat as well as the offer of some great rewards. Now in that day, in order to inflate their importance, astrologers often would imply that they did in fact have some kind of supernatural abilities. In this case, though, they, they know they can't fulfill the king's demands. And so they protest. They say, only the gods can reveal such mysteries. And gods do not live among men. However, Daniel is about to demonstrate that God, not the gods, God is alive and well. And that he is at work in the lives of faithful people. Now when the astrologers tell the king no, he flies into this incredible rage and he's so angry that he orders all of his counselors to be killed, not just the ones who let him down. And it's at this moment that Daniel and his friends now are sucked into this problem. They are in deep trouble. And yet it's here that we will see the wise faith of Daniel in action. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Think about that. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. <clears throat> At this, Daniel went into the king and asked four times so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed. The mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. 
And then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And he said, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You've made known to us the dream of the king. Let's put ourselves into Daniel's shoes for a minute and try to imagine this scene. You're going about your business. And then Arioch, the king's commander, comes up and tells you, Oh, 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 by the way, me and my men, we're here to put you to death. (laughs) I I mean, it seems to me to get that kind of of news out of the blue would be a proper occasion for a little panic. Be a proper time to show some fear or some shock. I mean, that's what I'd be tempted to do. I have spent way too much of my life responding to moments of crisis with anxiety or fear or panic. That's what we so often do. And yet, if we can be calm when others are anxious, if we can be calm rather than afraid, that's when we're more likely to see positive results. And that's how Daniel responds. His life is on the line. And yet he responds to Arioch with wisdom and tact. And the only logical explanation is that his faith protects him from fearful panic. But what really strikes me here is this. Daniel does not just have faith. He exercises his faith in a wise way. See, you, we, we can have faith and we can trust God, but it doesn't automatically mean that we will engage in wise behavior. Faithful people often do really stupid things. I've certainly done my share. And in this case, Daniel could foolishly make threats, or he could arrogantly denounce the king, or do any number of other things that would not be wise. That's not how he responds. He displays great wisdom in how he handles these circumstances. Wisdom that grows out of his deep faith in God. He doesn't just trust. He lets his trust in God guide his actions. And when we take our faith in God and we combine that with wisdom from God, then we are so much better able to navigate the challenges of life in an unbelieving world. And so what does Daniel, based on his faith, based on wisdom, what does he decide to do? He requests an audience with the king. Now on the one hand, That may not initially seem wise because the king is in a rather touchy mood, to say the least. And if Daniel visits him and irritates him further, the king could order not just his immediate death, but demand that he be tortured before his death. I mean, all kinds of bad things can happen when you stand before a king like Nebuchadnezzar. And yet this isn't foolish. Going to see the king is a way for Daniel to express his faith and his wisdom. You see, we know from chapter 1 that Daniel has been given the ability to interpret dreams and visions. But he's not, to the best of our knowledge, been given the ability to know what a dream is in advance. And when he goes in to see the king, he does not yet know what the dream is, nor does he know what it means. So he is acting with great faith. And second, we're told in chapter 1 that he has this gift, but we don't know if Daniel's actually used it yet. We've not seen it in action. 
It's not clear as Daniel goes in to see the king whether he actually knows yet how it's supposed to work. How will God manifest this gift in my life? Daniel is acting in great faith. And he's also acting wisely. Because he's going to approach the king and make a different kind of request than the one made by the astrologers. They insisted that the king tell them the dream. Then they would interpret it. Daniel doesn't ask for any details about the dream. He simply asks for time. It's a different kind of request and it leads to a different outcome. And so Daniel has been granted his request. And yet once the king gives him that time, now everything is on the line. And yet we don't see Daniel in any way give in to fear or to panic. He simply goes home and asks his three close friends to join him in prayer. Now that's faith. And there is tremendous Power and encouragement when we pray with and for each other. When believers come together to pray, there is power. And so these men ask God to be merciful. They ask God to spare their lives. And in response to their fervent prayers, that very night, God reveals the mystery of the king's dream. When you pray and God answers your prayer, what do you do? You take time to say thanks. You take time to praise God. Sometimes I forget to do that. I get so excited I've got an answer, I just rush along. Daniel doesn't do that. He offers this wonderful, wonderful prayer where he praises God and honors God and sincerely thanks God for doing something that truly is miraculous. And it's then, in response to his wise faith, he's now armed with God-given information, and he returns to the king to tell him what's going on. Verse 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, that's his Babylonian name, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And look again at how Daniel wisely responds. Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he's asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dreams and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in your bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. And as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me. I love this next line. Not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Daniel speaks to the king with great respect. And yet he also makes it clear that he serves God. And that God, not King Nebuchadnezzar, is ultimately in control of events. It would be so, so tempting in this moment for Daniel to exalt himself. To brag and boast about his incredible ability that no one else in the kingdom had. And he refuses to take any personal credit. He understands That God is working through these events. That God wants to give a message to this king. And Daniel's responsibility simply is to be the messenger. He is the one to deliver this message to the king. And so we see Daniel humbly 
and willingly play the role that God asks of him. What a wise and faithful response. And then he's going to describe the dream in detail and then interpret it. Verse 31. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue. An enormous, dazzling statue. Awesome in appearance. The head of the statue is made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Well, that's certainly clear, isn't it? I, I read this and I say to myself, either Daniel has an incredibly vivid imagination... Or God did, in fact, reveal to him this highly unusual dream that the king had. And as we see, the dream consists of this unusual statue whose, whose body parts are made up of different metals. And this statue ultimately is crushed by a rock. A rock not carved by human hands. And like many dreams, it's really kind of strange. And what's amazing is Daniel is able to tell the king what this dream means. He starts in verse 36. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power <clears throat> and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. Powerful words of praise for this king. And yet letting this powerful king know that any authority he has comes from God. Verse 39, after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true. And its interpretation is trustworthy. Daniel explains that this very weird dream is about five different kingdoms. And Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is first. It's represented by the head of gold. After Babylon, there's going to be three other kingdoms that arise. And they're represented by silver and bronze and iron. And they're going to come along and then they're going to fall. And from history and scripture... We know that these kingdoms will be the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. And then we come to the fifth kingdom. And it's different. 
because it's not represented by metal, but by a rock. A rock carved, but not by human hands. And this very distinct kingdom is going to conquer Rome. It's going to conquer all other empires, and it never will be destroyed. And so from our vantage point in history, we can say clearly this must be a reference to the kingdom of God. What other kingdom will last forever? Now, as I think about all that Daniel has said, it seems to me that his interpretation doesn't actually tell the king a whole lot. Because most of what he says is going to happen long after Nebuchadnezzar's dead. And while there is some general information here, it leaves a lot of questions. Is the dream referring to these ancient kingdoms literally or figuratively? Could this be some kind of metaphor for other kingdoms that will arise at some other point in time? Bible scholars and history buffs love to debate those details. And it seems there's a clear reference here to the kingdom of God, but when will the kingdom of God come to pass? Will the kingdom of God come into existence at the time of the Roman Empire, when Jesus walks the earth? Or will it come later on during some other empire when Jesus returns to earth? Those are all legitimate questions to discuss and to wonder about. Here's my answer. I believe that this dream finds its initial fulfillment when Jesus Christ is born and walks the earth. Because he begins his public ministry with these words. The time has come and the kingdom of God is at hand. And then his death and his burial and his resurrection defeated the power of sin and death and established his rule over all powers and authorities. And then as we see in the book of Acts, even the might and power of the Roman Empire is helpless, helpless against the power of the message of Christ and against the power and enduring nature of God's church. And so the kingdom of God was initiated during Christ's first coming. And it will be fully established forever when he returns again. God's kingdom is both now and not yet. But God's kingdom is being established. It will endure forever. Nothing can stand against it. And the message for King Nebuchadnezzar is not you or any earthly empire can stand against God. And if he understands nothing else from this dream, that's what he must understand. That is what God wants him to know. Now it takes faith wise faith to communicate that kind of message to a tyrannical leader who can order your torture and your death for any perceived insult or slight. And Daniel has expressed himself with tact and respect and has not held back the truth. And so how does this tyrannical ruler respond to this message? Look what happens next. Verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. And a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all, all its wise men. 
Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. The king responds with awe. Daniel knows what the dream was. He, he knew the images of the dream, and then he was able to interpret it. And somehow, in what Daniel communicates, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled. I'm sure he doesn't understand all that it means, but he's humbled by what he has heard. And so he throws himself at Daniel's feet, he promotes Daniel to a position of high authority, and he promotes Daniel's three friends as well. And we need to understand that these are divine promotions. They're divine promotions because it's God who is orchestrating these events. We can only conclude that God clearly wants some of his people to have roles of influence and to live daily life right at the heart of this evil Babylonian empire where they can be a godly influence. Sometimes it's really tempting as men and women of faith to want to separate ourselves out from the culture, to want to barricade ourselves off from evil, to build a fortress around ourselves so we don't have to deal with the ungodly world. But in this case, God is saying, I don't want my people to be isolated from that culture. I want and need my people to be witnesses within that culture. And Daniel and his friends are appointed to that task. God always needs faithful people to share his truth, and to be his light in the midst of ungodly culture. And the response to this interpretation by Daniel, uh, the response by the king, uh, on the one hand it's amazing, and on the other hand it's, it's kind of sad. Because <laughs> he knows he's had an encounter with God. That's clear by his words and by his Humble posture. And yet, he bows before Daniel. He doesn't bow before God. He refers to your God. He's not able to say, my God. Nebuchadnezzar's in awe, but his heart is not yet broken. His ego is not yet broken. And therefore, he is unable to humble himself before God. So what's happened is exciting, but the work in Nebuchadnezzar's life clearly is not yet done. Now, this is just the first of several dreams that occur in the book of Daniel, and, and most of them are very wild and very weird like this one. And it's easy to get caught up in trying to nail down the specifics of what each dream means, but there's something bigger at stake here. And at least in this case, I don't believe the dream is the ultimate point. I don't believe the meaning of the dream is the ultimate point. Not at least in this moment. I believe the dream simply is a tool that God uses to make a profound impact in the life of Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar. Simply because the king has a dream that needs interpretation. Some incredible things take place. Daniel's faith is challenged. And he's able to respond with wise faith to this life-threatening crisis. He doesn't descend into fearful panic. What a great example for us. He sees God respond to his prayers in a dramatic way, which certainly would deepen his faith. And God uses that moment to elevate Daniel and his friends to strategic positions of leadership. God uses that moment to demonstrate his power, his sovereignty, and to let everyone know, including this king, I'm in charge. Incredible things happen simply because the king needed to have a dream interpreted. Now, as we consider the implications of this story for our own lives, I think we need to recognize that many parts of the Bible, particularly many of these stories in the Old Testament, 
are descriptive, not necessarily prescriptive. In other words, God is describing events from which we can learn some timeless principles, but he's not necessarily prescribing what we should do. And so, for example, we don't read this story and walk away expecting to be dream interpreters. God is describing that in Daniel's life. He's not prescribing that for us. What we can do is learn from Daniel's example. And like him, we can choose to respond to moments of crisis with wise faith rather than fearful panic. And like him, we can pray and ask God to guide us. We can ask other believers to join with us and pray together and ask God to guide us, to give us the faith and wisdom that we need so that we can do what is right in our circumstances. Circumstances that will be very different than Daniel's. And yet circumstances in which his example can instruct us. And when we follow his example, when we resolve to face whatever comes our way with wise faith. That's when we can, that's when we will make an impact on the unbelieving world around us. Just as Daniel did.